All right, well, thank you very much. It's a, a real pleasure to be here. Uh, I've never visited Lawrence Livermore before, and uh, I'm really enjoying getting to hear more about uh, some of the work that's going on here and, and getting to meet many of you. Uh, so today I'm going to tell you about some of the work that I've done over uh, the last uh, decade or so now on photon limited imaging. And as many of you, and I don't have somehow, there we go. Uh, and as many of you know, uh, photon limited imaging arises when we collect image data by measuring a small number of photons hitting a detector. And when that number of photons is small, then we really are faced with the dark side of image reconstruction. So photon limited imaging uh, might sound a little esoteric at the outset, but in fact it uh, arises in a number of different settings. Um, maybe the most obvious is night vision, so hunters or um, soldiers or, or even some uh, recent car models are using night vision imaging in order to detect animals or objects uh, or people in very low light settings. Um, so photon limited image might look something like this. So you can see each white dot in this picture would correspond to a single photon hitting our detector. And from this kind of image, what we'd like to do is to understand, well, what's the underlying distribution of light in this scene? So if we had the time to sit and collect photons for 100 years, then we might get a very nice, clear, crisp image akin to what you might get on your iPhone in a well-lit scenario. But in night vision, you would like to have just the small number of photons and still be able to figure out what that underlying nice, crisp image is. And in this particular example, it corresponds to a, a patch that many of our troops wear that's supposed to be particularly visible in low light settings to avoid um, friendly fire kinds of issues and let, let troops identify their, their, co, um, their friends and cohorts. In addition to night vision, we see um, photon limited imaging arise in a number of different forms of microscopy. Uh, one example of this is fluorescence microscopy. So some collaborators of mine at the University of Wisconsin collected this data where they were looking at some biological specimen. And if they train their fluorescent microscope on it for 120 seconds, then you get this really nice crisp image that we see on the far right. But if you try to collect your image more quickly or if you try to use less fluorescent dye, then you get many fewer photon counts. And you'd really like to be able to operate in this photon limited regime for a few reasons. You want to be able to do high throughput experiments, so you don't want to have to sit and wait for tens of minutes to collect photons to get a crisp image. You'd also like to be able to have high temporal resolution for living cells, so if things are moving around, you can't just sit and integrate over time without starting to blur all of that motion. And you can't try to just inject more fluorescent dye to increase the number of photons you're collecting because it's going to cause problems like photo bleaching or it'll kill living cells. I think uh, many of you will work perhaps in material science where you would have similar kinds of issues. You might be shooting an electron beam at your material sample and if you shoot too much of a beam or too high energy or too much power at your sample then you destroy it and so you'd very, like to very quickly collect photon limited observations and still infer what your sample looks like. Even in regimes where we wouldn't really think about it as being dark, we still have to think about photon limitations. And a great example of this is spectral imaging. So if you've got a satellite collecting spectral images, so for each location in space, you would measure the spectrum of the light that's been reflected. Uh, you start having to worry about photon limitations because as you increase the spectral resolution of your image, then you're going to have fewer and fewer po photons per spectral band. And so these images can become very noisy very quickly even if the total amount of ambient light is, um, is high. So you have suddenly start to face this trade-off between the resolution of the images and how much noise that you have. A final example, um, or I'm sorry, not, not final, but another example of this is in astronomy. So I worked with some um, X-ray astronomers at North Carolina State University. It's maybe a little bit easier to see on this board. And they're trying to analyze the physics of a Kepler supernova 
which uh, is being observed in some of the earliest stages for which we have recorded measurements. So they really want to understand how this thing is forming and developing. And so they've measured different x-rays, x-ray photons, and their wavelengths. And they have all of this extremely photon limited uh, um, uh, x-ray imaging data, or spectral imaging data. And they'd like to understand the, these underlying physical properties. And if you just treat the data in its raw form, without trying to use methods from signal and image processing, then it's very difficult to make any real headway. OK, and a final example is simply low-dose computed tomography, where you would maybe like to image a kid, and you want to limit the amount of x-ray dose you're giving your, your child or your sample. And so you have to deal with much higher noise levels than we typically see in clinical settings in order to uh, reconstruct the image. So in all of these settings, uh, you know, it may be pretty obvious what we'd like to be able to do. Oh, no, there's no volume. Oh, man, I had such a beautiful clip for you. What's that? The best part. I know. Well, I'm sorry. I don't know how to turn the volume on this computer. Um, but MacGyver says we want to enhance. And the guy at the end says our eigenvalues are off. And so we really need to be careful about how we treat our data, how we enhance it, and how we analyze our eigenvalues to be able to actually make sense of this photon-limited data. So you might say, well, let's, there's lots of different methods for image processing and image analysis. Can't we just use those? I mean, are these photon limitations really that kind of significant in practice? And here's, I think, a nice example of why I think they are significant and worth considering. If I take this photon-limited image, and try to denoise it with what's currently the state of the art for image denoising, BM3D, just plug it in blindly. Then I get an estimate. Arguably, it's better than the raw data. But it's got quite a few artifacts. And what we're going to see is that we can do significantly better than this if we really take the photon limitations into account from the outset. OK, so let's just get a little bit more precise about what we mean here, uh, or what our model is for this photon limited data. So we're going to observe a vector of photon counts y. So each element of this vector, yi, is going to be a realization of a Poisson random variable. And the intensity, or the mean of that Poisson random variable, is going to correspond to our true image f star after it has been, um, after we've made projective measurements of it through some sensing matrix A. And then t is going to correspond to how long we sit and collect our photons, our stare time, or you could also think about it as our dose, or how much overall uh, power we have in our system, or our overall photon level. So f star is what we really want to estimate. This is our object of interest. t is going to control our signal to noise ratio. This is something that we can kind of tune as practitioners or as users. And A is going to correspond to a physical model of our imaging system. So it might just be an identity matrix and a simple denoising problem. But it could correspond to blur. It could correspond to tomographic projections or compressed sensing kinds of measurements or what have you. And one of the things that is worth noting about this sort of observation model is that we have some physical constraints that aren't um, uh, uh, that don't arise in traditional, say, compressed sensing or Gaussian inverse problem settings. So in particular, for our image, our observations, and even the elements of our sensing matrix, everything is non-negative. Right? We can't measure negative numbers of photons. If you think about A as describing the propagation of light through an optical system, you can't have um, one beam of light subtracted from another beam. So everything is inherently non-negative. And in addition, because we've got this Poisson noise, we might recall that the variance of a Poisson random variable is equal to its mean. And so the variance of all these different measurements are, are different and signal dependent and unknown. OK, so this is going to make things more complicated when we try to infer f. So to start, I want to talk about kind of a, a simple subproblem here which is when A just corresponds to an identity matrix or an identity operator, and we just want to do denoising, then what can we do to handle these photon limitations? And you saw how scarce the photons were in some of these example images. 
And ultimately, the only way we're going to be able to counteract that sparsity of data or scarcity of data is by exploiting sparsity or other kinds of low dimensional structure in the underlying image. And so the name of the game here is really how do we find and exploit that low dimensional structure when we only have a small number of, of photons. So some of you might be familiar with something called a variance stabilizing transform. And the basic idea here is we're going to take all this Poisson data, transform it so it looks kind of Gaussian, and then use whatever standard techniques we already have for Gaussian data. Uh, and people have explored this for a long time. And a popular approach is something called the Anscombe transform. So in our denoising problem, y is Poisson, and the underlying image is f star. And the first thing you would do with this Anscombe transform is you would take each pixel in y, and you would basically take a, a square root transform of it. You add a little bit, take the square root, and rescale it. And you get these random variables, these z's. And these z's, you can show, are approximately Gaussian distributed. And the mean of that Gaussian scales like the square root of our true image, the thing that we're after. But the variance of all these Gaussians are 1. So whereas before, every pixel might have a different variance because it was Poisson data, after this Anscombe transform, Everything has a variance of 1. And we can start saying um, or start utilizing methods that have been developed for Gaussian noise kinds of settings. So you might take these z's and feed them into this state-of-the-art denoising method, like BM3D, to get an estimate. And then invert this Anscombe transform to get an estimate of f. So this is a popular approach. We're going to see an example of it on the next slide. But I just want to mention a couple of things. First of all, if you're very photon limited, so that all of your y's are just zeros or ones, then doing this kind of square root transform doesn't really do a whole lot to your data. So you have to be, so this is useful for pseudo photon limited scenarios, where you have some photon limitations, or maybe using BM3D without any transformation is not the right thing to do. But if you're extremely photon limited, then this approach has its, has its breaking point. In addition, because of this square root operation, this method really does not extend or generalize to inverse problems well. right? Because if I had a linear inverse problem, then by taking this Anscombe transform, suddenly I'd get a nonlinear inverse problem, and things become much, much more challenging. So this is really only appropriate for this kind of simple uh, denoising set scenario. Yeah? I'm sorry, can I ask that one question? <laughs> Right. I'm assuming that I only. I'm sorry, what, what did you say about K? F sub J, no, the J on the previous slide. Oh, I see. I so here. No, sorry, let me clarify. F sub J would be the jth pixel in F. That's a pixel in there. Right. Okay. So this is sort of the vector representation. And so here, f might have p different pixels in it. Okay. So it would be a length p vector. y might have n different measurements in it corresponding to a detector array with n different elements. And then a would be an n by p matrix. And I wanted to emphasize the fact that the different elements of y are independent of one another conditioned on this intensity. So each detector, this would correspond to the measurement at the ith detector element. And it's going to depend on multiple different pixels in F, depending on the configuration of my imaging system. But I really am only getting one snapshot. Um, so I only get one vector Y. And in the denoising case, then this matrix A is simply the identity matrix. So yi is Poisson with intensity fi, uh, where fi is just the ith pixel in my image. Yeah, so just a single shot. Um, and so I'm applying this Anscombe transform, for instance, to each pixel independently. And then I do this um, BM3D or whatever other kind of denoising I want to do. Yeah, great. Thanks for asking. Are there any other questions? OK, so this was kind of the standard approach for photon limited imaging uh, for many years. Uh, and it's still quite popular. Um, so let's just kind of take a look at it in action. This is our noisy data. 
This is what happens if we don't account for Poisson noise at all. We get something that looks pretty bad. And this is what happens if we use this Anscombe transform approach. And it's, it's not a problem with the projector. It really does work very poorly when you have highly photon limited data. Now, a few years ago, um, Mekitalo and Poi came up with a slightly different approach to that very last step of inverting this Anscombe transform that essentially amounts to um, uh, contrast enhancement. And you can see that it results in significant improvements over these alternatives. So it's a viable approach. It takes into account Poisson noise. But as we talked about, it certainly has its limitations in terms of being able to um, handle inverse problems or very, very low photon counts. So the question is, can we do better by considering Poisson noise or photon limitations kind of throughout the process instead of just trying to sweep it under the rug via this Anscombe transform? And so that's one of the things that, that my lab has done. And so as I mentioned earlier, what we really need to do is try to figure out a way to exploit some sort of low dimensional structure in the image and find that using these small numbers of photons. And one model of image structure is based on patches. So a patch is just a collection of contiguous pixels in the image. And if you were to look at the patches of, say, this image, you could notice that these green patches are all more or less the same. The purple patches are more or less the same. The red patches are more or less the same. And so there's a large amount of redundancy in this image. And this example looks a little bit contrived. But in fact, this sort of redundancy within images um, is a good model for wide classes of images and underlies popular methods like non-local means, BM3D, dictionary learning, and, and many others. So it's a very general and flexible model uh, that seems to fit well to real world data. So the question is, could we somehow find and exploit this redundancy in photon limited images? OK, so I'm going to uh, argue that we can. And I'm going to present that in the case study of a material science problem that I've been working on with some collaborators at the University of Wisconsin. So this is some data collected by um, the University of Manchester of calcium-doped neodymium titanate using an EDS imaging system. EDS is electron um, uh, dispersive spectroscopy. And they are collecting a photon-limited spectral image. So each one of these images corresponds to a different spectral band. So you can think about this as like having a stack of seven images. And we would like to denoise it. You can see that it, it's very noisy. Um, and we'd like to understand the underlying sort of material structure here. And so what we're going to do is explore this sort of patch-based model. And just to make the concepts a little bit easier, I'm going to focus on a 2D image. But all of these ideas generalize to a stack of images across wavelengths very simply. So as I mentioned before, um, we're going to divide our image into patches. These patches can overlap. We're going to look at every patch in the image. And we're going to consider the collection of all of these patches and exploit structure among this collection of patches. And our key modeling idea is that all of these patches lie in a union of subspaces. So let me explain that a little bit more. So I start with my image. I look at a patch. So here's a single patch here. I'm then going to just reorganize all the pixels to form a vector. And then I'm going to concatenate all the vectors corresponding to all the patches in the image to form a giant matrix. And with real data, this matrix would be very noisy. But as you can see, there's sort of a lot of structure in here. And so what we'd like to be able to do is to exploit that structure to remove noise from the matrix and hence remove noise from the image. And as I mentioned, our model is a union of subspaces model. So I've got this collection of patches. And these different colored bars correspond to different kinds of patches in my image. And so our model is that it's possible to take this matrix and divide it into different submatrices, where each of these submatrix corresponds to some columns from our original matrix. And each one of these matrices is low rank. Another way of thinking about this is the following. Let's say that my patch is like a 3 by 3 block of pixels. Then this column is a length 9 vector. And I can think about it as a point in a 9-dimensional space. 
And my model is that if I look at the point cloud of all these nine dimensional patches, they aren't just sort of uniformly distributed in space, but rather they lie along a union of subspaces or a collection of different hyperplanes. And so what we'd like to be able to do is to find that union of hyperplanes and project all of our noisy patches onto it in order to remove the Poisson noise. And in fact, this is exactly what we do. Sarah, yeah, Grace. They do, yes. That's right. So if I had n pixels in my original image, then I would have n columns in this matrix. Yeah, exactly. Was there another question? Right. I mean, I guess technically you wouldn't have to do that, but empirically that leads to significant improvements in, in performance. OK, so the basic idea would be to, for instance, take your image and divide it into patches, form this matrix, and do some clustering of the columns of the matrix. So find which patches belong to which subspace. And then estimate those subspaces and project all the patches onto the subspaces. And for most of these steps, we can get improvements in performance by explicitly accounting for the Poisson noise. So clustering methods, for instance, for trying to decide which patches are similar to one another are typically based on the squared Euclidean distance between patches. But instead, we can use a Bregman divergence based on the Poisson distribution to get much better clusterings. Similarly, when we're trying to estimate sort of the low rank structure in these matrices or trying to estimate these hyperplanes or subspaces, we can use a negative Poisson log likelihood to perform that estimation much more accurately and in a way that accounts for the non-uniform variance in our noise and uh, other challenges. And so if we do that, then we can get significant performance improvements. So this, again, is our toy photon limited image that we've been playing with here. This is the result of using this Anscombe transform and then plugging that data into a method that's really designed for Gaussian noise. And this is the result of this union of subspaces model that takes into account Poisson noise right from the very beginning. Now, this is a toy image, but we applied this data or this approach to um, the spectral imaging data that we got in this um, from this EDS spectral imaging system. And so here is the experimental data for four of the spectral bands in the top row, and in the bottom row, we're seeing the results of our, our denoising method. And so for instance, if you look at the titanium K beta band, it's very hard by eye to see any kind of real structure there. The noise is really dominating this data. But by looking for this union of subspaces and kind of constraining our flexibility and denoising that way, we're able to pull out the crystalline structure that's underlying uh, that data very accurately. Are there any questions? Does this make sense? Right. So with this particular um, uh, material sample, there's sort of a, a crystal structure. The things are on almost like a lattice. And what you're looking at is a cross section of that. And so that's why you see that kind of cross hatch. And it might look a little bit miraculous, but what's happening here is that there are some spectral bands where that crystalline structure is clearer than others, where we've got different contrast to noise ratios. And because we're looking at these patches or blocks of pixels or voxels all at once, we're able to exploit information that we learn about redundancies in one band in order to do a better job at denoising another band. Yeah. Yeah, so that's a great question. So let's just say that we had a single subspace or a single hyperplane, and it was rank R. Then what that would tell us is that we could represent any of the patches in our image as a weighted combination of some R representative patches. So with this union of subspaces model, we're saying, well, for some patches, we've got one set of R representatives. And for other patches, we've got a different set of R representatives. But for each patch, we can find a set of R representative patches, and R patch is a weighted combination of those representatives. That's more or less what we're saying. How do you pick the rank of that? I don't know, is that something that you found there, or do you have to add it to 
Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, for the software that we have online, it's just a tuning parameter that somebody could choose or uh, set via cross-validation. Um, you could do other things like look at the, um, the spectrum of this matrix and look at the eigenvalue or the singular value decay and see where it sort of drops off suddenly. Um, it's a little bit more challenging to do with Poisson noise. And so uh, what we do is we uh, do some fancy initialization to kind of sidestep that. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Yeah. Yes. No, it doesn't. So what this does, what all of these patch-based methods do, is exploit redundancy in the image. So the more you have sort of repeating structures or redundancies, the better off you're going to be. Um, so one of, there's some, some literature in this uh, general area on something called the rare patch effect, which says, imagine that I've got a nice image, oh, let me pull up my flag, nice flag image like this, but somehow buried in the middle here, I've got one patch that's just totally different from the others. Then I'm not going to be doing a particularly good job at denoising that patch because I don't have a whole lot of other things that are similar to it. Um, that said, um, it's not quite as constrained as you might think. So if you were to think about non-local means, it's really relying heavily on there being lots of patches that are very, very similar to one another. But in this image, for instance, there are also a lot of patches that are just sort of the, um, the negative of this, right? Black on top, white on the bottom, but in terms of structure, they're really the same, right? <laughs> one is negative one times the other. So non-local means would not be able to exploit that similarity because from a Euclidean distance standpoint, those two patches are very, very different from one another. But with the approach that we're describing using a union of subspaces, those two patches would lie exactly in the same subspace. And so even though visually they don't necessarily look like the same patch, there's still that kind of extra degree of redundancy in the image, and that helps quite a bit. So you're right, you do need to have some redundancy. for The, the more redundancy you have, the better these methods work. On the other hand, you know, it's not necessary that you have a strongly repeating structure that's quite as you know, um, obvious as we see in the flag or as in crystalline structures in, in materials. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. If you want to exploit, if you want to exploit rotational uh, symmetry in the image and the patches, how, mm. do you trans can you transform the image somehow before you do this process or what, what would you do in that situation? A naive thing you can do <coughs> is make several copies of your image, each at a different rotation and then um, look at the space of all of those patches so that you're averaging over multiple different rotations. Um, by actually doing that for something like Poisson data is, is difficult except for say 90 degree rotations because in order to do this rotation you have to do interpolation. Once you start interpolating your photon limited measurements the Poisson model would break down after the interpolation and so things would get a little bit dicey there. What people have spent more time looking at is non-rectangular patches. So that's not really necessary here because things are very nicely aligned with our grid. But they'll look at things like patches that are more wedge-shaped so that they can butt up against, say, a diagonal edge in an image to get more accuracy along those edges. Uh, so there are lots of different variants on these general approaches. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. Um, I mean, there are going to be some patches in this image of the face, for example, that are very smooth. And for those patches, it could, hurt. It could help, yes, potentially. And I'll talk about that a little bit more. For things like the patches overlapping with the eye, 
it's, if you rotate it, it's going to look very different. Those patches are still very different. They're still very rare. And so there's not, even doing this rotation trick won't help all that much, I think. Yeah, I, I guess what I mean is if you take, for example, the shape, the, the, the overall shape of, the, of, the, of a head or something, you know, where you have like, like almost like a boundary, and if you would turn your head with, uh, or basically rotate your view, you would see basically always something which is redundant. But if you would always keep your patches with one with one angle it would basically all patches would look differently while if you would rotate them they they would at some rotation angles look all very similar yeah it's an interesting idea uh, i haven't thought a lot about it um but yeah it'd be interesting to explore that um one thing i do want to mention this has been studied more in the context of non-local means but people often worry about overfitting to noise, which is obviously something we have to worry about quite a bit because we've got a lot of noise here. And so when you're searching for similar pixels, if you've got you know, a huge field of view image, so you've just got you know, millions and millions of patches, and you're looking for similar patches to your kind of target among these millions, you might find some that are very close just by chance because of the noise. And so um, sometimes people will try to do things like only look in localized regions for matching patches to sort of reduce that uh, overfitting to noise. So when you talk about these ideas like looking at different rotations of the image, maybe a large number of different rotations, then yes, you're going to have more examples of patches in these subspaces. But on the other hand, you also run the risk of overfitting to noise a little bit more, I would imagine. So it's, it's just not entirely obvious to me exactly how that would play out. Yeah, we're thinking about though. Is there another? Yes. Oh, I'm wondering, is there a magical patch size for any context that the noise in the scan or the context that the you know, the speech size is in Yeah, that's a great question. So in um in Gaussian noise settings, the magical size is usually on the order of 8 by 8 or 10 by 10. You see that very commonly. Um, but in photon limited settings, it's a little bit trickier than that. Because if you were extremely photon limited, you could imagine having a lot of 8 by 8 patches that only have a single photon in them. And so then you have to start thinking about um, overfitting to noise quite a bit, right? Because you could, might find a whole bunch of patches that look exactly the same, even though they're really in very different contexts. And you could get significant artifacts because of that. And so in this context, you really have to think about scaling the size of your patch with the average number of photons per pixel, um, which is something that has not really been studied uh, in this context or the Gaussian noise context. All right, so this was all about denoising and using sparsity and low dimensional structure to get some accurate um, image inferences from small numbers of photons. And there's a lot of methods out there. I've kind of highlighted a few that look very promising. But what you might ask is how we might use these insights and lessons learned to better understand various inverse problems, which I started talking about at the very beginning. And I'd like to talk a little bit more about that now. So I think uh, either last year or a couple of years ago, Rich Baranuk gave your keynote address at your, your annual workshop here, right? And he probably talked about the single pixel camera that his lab developed, is that right? Okay, so you take a scene, you would project it onto an array of mirrors, Roughly half those mirrors reflect light onto a photodiode. You collect that measurement, and then you change your mirror configuration, get a new measurement, et cetera. And this is a really nice kind of physical implementation of the ideas of compressed sensing. And Rich would tell you, you know, TI, who makes these digital micromirror arrays, is constantly improving the speed at which they can um, flip these mirrors. So it seems like you can make this system faster and faster or get more and more measurements more quickly. But as you increase the speed at which you flip your mirrors, then the less time you have to sit and collect photons for every mirror orientation. So imagine that you've got a total time budget T. Let's just say one minute over which you want to collect your image. 
And now you need to decide how many different projections should I collect within my one minute? Should I collect 10 projections? Should I collect 100, 1,000? If I were to increase the number of projections, then I'm going to increase the noise. And so I've got this sort of question. Do I want a large number of very noisy measurements? Do I want a small number of, of, less, of lower, I'm sorry, a small number of high quality measurements? What's sort of the sweet operational spot here uh, when we take into account the fact that we're only going to be able to collect a certain number of photons within this, say, 10 minute interval over this time period T? And similar kinds of questions arise in applications like tomography. So I've got some, some sample that I want to estimate, and I'm going to shoot a, let's say, x-ray through it in a fan beam. And this would be a single projection. And what we see often at GE with clinical scanners is that you would then collect these kinds of measurements for a sort of a uniform collection of different angles. But if you wanted to work in low dose CT, say for little kids, and you only have so much x-ray dose that you're willing to send through your sample, then you could say, well, is that really the best way to collect measurements? Is it best to have this full angle, large number of very noisy measurements? Or would it make sense to, for instance, have a smaller number of less noisy measurements? What's going to kind of be the right way to sense this, this spe sample or specimen? Okay, so you might think that compressed sensing literature would help answer this question, but because we have photon-limited observations, because we have Poisson noise, a lot of these trade-offs are very different than what we might expect. So here's, again, the same sensing model that we talked about before, just to refresh your memory. Y is our set of measurements, and we've got N different projections. T is our total dose or data acquisition time. It's a measure of our signal-to-noise ratio. A is our sensing matrix, and F star, this image that we want to reconstruct, has got P different pixels. It is sparse in some basis or dictionary D. And the total brightness of our scene or of our image is going to be constrained to 1, just so that T now is really reflecting the total signal to noise ratio of our system and nothing sort of swept under the rug through F. OK, so the question is, how well can we reconstruct F star from Y? And in particular, how do things depend on N, our number of projections, P, the number of pixels, T, how much time we spend, D, our sparsifying dictionary, and A, our sensing matrix? OK, so let's try to dive into this a little bit and get a little bit of intuition. And the first thing that's worth noting is that we face some pretty significant physical constraints here that are not reflected in most of the compressed sensing literature and not even in most of the more general uh, inverse problem literature. In particular, uh, I like to think about the ijth element of this sensing matrix A as corresponding to the likelihood that a photon coming from location J in my image hitting our detector at location I and if you think about it in terms of these likelihoods or probabilities, then some constraints become pretty immediately obvious. So each element of this sensing matrix has to be between 0 and 1. Our columns should sum to 1 because a photon coming from one location can only go to one other location. can't go to more than one with high probability. And the overall number of photons that we collect can't be any bigger than the total number of photons sort of going into the aperture of our imaging system. OK, so these are all very natural, very mild sort of assumptions about our sensing matrix. But every single one of them is violated by the standard sort of compressed sensing setup. And so we, if we want to understand how these sort of imaging systems are going to work, we're going to have to kind of think deeply and not just plug in pre-existing results. So I first want to just give you a sense of why we have um, uh, particular challenges in this Poisson noise setting. So let's start with a standard compressed sensing imaging matrix A tilde, which is just full of plus and minus ones appropriately scaled. And this is the kind of compressed sensing matrix that, say, Rich Bernick had in mind when he designed his single pixel camera. And with high probability, this is going to satisfy the restricted isometry property. It's got all kinds of beautiful properties that we might exploit in a standard compressed sensing uh, setup. 
But of course, we're violating these physical constraints. There's negative elements. The scaling doesn't guarantee that things integrate to one the way they should. And so what we're going to do when we think about a physically realizable system is take that A tilde, add an offset, and rescale it. And this new A now has the same general structure as A tilde, but it satisfies all of our physical constraints. So let's think about what this is doing. So our measurement model is y is Poisson with intensity t a f star. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to replace this a with this expression here that it says, you know, let me decompose it into our standard compressed sensing matrix plus an offset divided by some rescaling. So t a tilde f star this blue thing, and I've got a blue plot here that shows it for some toy problem, is what we'd like to sense. This is the kind of thing that most of the compressed sensing literature analyzes. If we measured this thing in blue, how well can we recover F star? Okay, but because of our physical constraints, we don't measure this exactly, but we first of all rescale it. So instead of having this amplitude of about 15, we're going to have this amplitude of about 1. And then we are going to add this constant offset at the green level so that even before we have Poisson noise, the intensity or the expected value of our measurements is this red signal here. So in a pure mathematical form, this red signal has all the same information as the blue signal. But we were, you might recall that with a Poisson noise model, the variance is equal to the mean. And so if we've got this tiny amplitude signal with this giant green mean here, and we start having Poisson noise uh, contaminating our measurements of this red signal, then suddenly we've got a very big problem that's not reflected in a model that doesn't account for our physical constraints. Does that make sense? OK. So let's try to think about how well we can actually recover F star in this sort of setup where we have to deal with this signal dependent noise and these physical constraints. And we're going to look at something called a minimax rate. So we're looking at the best possible estimator that we might come up with. And I'm going to talk about estimators in a couple of minutes. But for now, just think about the very best possible estimator anyone could use. And the hardest problem in this class of sparse images that we're interested in, and we're going to look at the expected mean squared error over that family. So when t is large, when our signal to noise ratio is high, then this expected mean squared error scales like s log p over t. So a couple of things to note. First of all, it increases with s, which is probably very expected considering a lot of the other literature in this area. But what we see is that what's controlling how quickly this error goes down is t, how much time we spend sensing, or our overall, say, electron beam dose. And n, the number of measurements that we collect, is not showing up here at all, which might seem very surprising. But in fact, this is reflected in different simulations. And it answers one of the kind of main questions we raised at the very beginning here. We said, is it better to have a large number of very noisy measurements, or is it better to have a small number of high quality measurements? And these results show us that as long as n is just big enough to satisfy something like the restricted isometry property, then it really doesn't matter that the number of projections plays a very minor role relative to the total number of photons that we're collecting, which is going to be proportional to t. OK, so that gives us a little bit of insight. But all of this really only holds when t is large, when we've got a relatively large number of photons. So what happens in the truly photon-limited regime? So what we could do is we could plot this mean squared error versus t. And what we see is that when t is big, then our theory holds exactly. Things are just scaling like 1 over t. But we have this, these sharp elbows in the rates, where when t is small, we get um, mean squared errors that do not sort of degrade gracefully with t. Instead, we see that there's sort of a, a key cutoff point, and that if t is not above that cutoff point, then we're not going to be able to get good reconstructions at all. Okay. 
So what's really happening in these low intensities? Another kind of key thing to note in this plot is that depending on whether we are looking at signals that are sparse in a wavelet basis or in a discrete cosine transform basis, we get different rates at these low intensities. And so you might ask why, because it's certainly in the traditional compressed sensing literature, the particular basis in which you're sparse doesn't play a significant role, but we're seeing here it plays a, a highly significant role. Well, what we see when we do the analysis is that this mean squared error that we're interested in characterizing depends on just one thing. It depends on the difference between our true image and its mean. So I take my image and I calculate the mean of all the pixels and I make a constant image with that intensity. And I look at the difference between the two and I look at the kind of energy in that difference. And this residual energy is what controls our mean squared error at low signal to noise ratios or when T is small. And this residual energy can be very big or very small depending on what basis we're using to represent our signal and our, our sparse signal. So if you use a cosine basis, then it's hard to get a really huge uh, residual energy. If you use a wavelet basis, it's much easier. And in fact, if we go back to this plot, we see that these residual energy quantities that I was referring to exactly align with the sort of plateau in these mean squared error plots. So what this is telling us is that at low intensities, when T is small, there is nothing you can do with the data. The best thing you can do is to estimate your image as being a constant. And that constant estimate is going to be the best thing you can do until you hit a critical threshold in the total number of photons you're collecting, at which point sort of more standard CS reconstructions start to actually help. Yeah. It's not just in energy in general, but it, this residual energy. So I'm taking my image and subtracting the mean. So if I've got an image that has a lot of energy, but it's mostly flat, then that residual energy will be close to zero. If I've got an image that looks like a delta function, then but it has the same kind of energy in the image itself, this residual energy would be very big because there's a lot of deviations from that mean level. So what's really kind of um, controlling the height of these lines is sort of the peakiness of our image. And deviations from the mean is coming from the noise, is that correct? No, what's happening is that we're saying um, you've got these compressive measurements. There's so much noise in them that the best estimator you can use is the estimator that says your image is a constant. So all of the unknown non-zero coefficients, you're going to estimate to be zero because any other estimate is worse at these signal to noise ratios. And so that constant approximation is the best estimate you can get of your image. And this is essentially how bad the error of that constant approximation can be. And that's what controls our errors at these low signal to noise ratios. So it's a... Um, it's not overly conservative. We see it in practice, but it's also a little bit of a discouraging result, right? Because it's telling us that you have to have this sort of critical number of photons before any kind of estimation starts to make sense or give you anything better than estimating your non-zero coefficients to all be zero. Yes? That's right. So what you would hope is that these curves would sort of, I don't know, just kind of continue as T gets smaller. So maybe my error would be, get worse as T gets smaller, but still just sort of um, decay gracefully. But what we're seeing is that it's all, this all or nothing thing where for a big swath of signal and noise ratios, you get absolutely nothing out of your data. And then suddenly you hit this sort of critical point and then you can start getting something out of it. But there's not sort of this nice, graceful curve for all T.
Yes. Uh, I'd just like to point out that I know I've seen cases, uh, depending on the waiver, where the waiver of trans point can cause the, uh, the method to be at least approximately rotation invariant. So you're talking about rotation there. Um, rotation may not help you if you're using a waiver of trans point. Yeah, for this kind of setting, rotating the image doesn't really help a whole lot. Yeah. yeah. Um, Mathematical rotations do play a key role here. Um, that's one of the tools that they use in the Gaussian setting that's not available to us here and makes the analysis especially interesting and, and challenging. Um, okay, I'm going to move ahead slightly. So one of the ramifications of all of this is that CS can be absolutely the wrong tool to use when you have really photon-limited data. Um, so let's consider a special case that illustrates this idea. Let's imagine that our image is sparse in a wavelet basis. And remember, s is our number of non-zeros. And of those, s prime are going to be the non-zero coefficients at coarse scales. So it corresponds to how much low frequency content is in our scene, more or less. So what we can do is we can compare compressed sensing with the mechanism that's in most night vision cameras, which is just collect a really low resolution image. So each pixel has a relatively high signal to noise ratio. And we can actually compare and contrast these two paradigms. And what we see is that with compressed sensing, these rates we derived are totally independent of how much low frequency content is in the scene. Whereas if you just collect a low frequency, or I'm sorry, a low resolution image, so you're just directly measuring your coarse coefficients and completely ignoring the fine scale coefficients, then the errors depend on S prime. And rather than dive into it, I'm just going to show you a plot. Oh, you saw see the same plot in theory and simulation. The red curve is the same curve we saw before for the errors for compressed sensing. We have this plateau and then this critical point past which we start getting good reconstructions. And in contrast, I've got these downsampling or direct sensing estimators for different values of S prime. So different lines here correspond to different amounts of low frequency content in our scene. And what we see is that for low signal to noise ratios, having um, directly measuring the low frequency coefficients gives you much better performance than anything compressive. And that continues to be true until you get past to this critical point, at which point downsampling works badly because you don't get any information at all about the high frequency coefficients. And compressed sensing starts to work better. And so when you try to design systems that are going to be collecting photon limited data, you have to think very carefully about uh, how photon limited you are, what your signal to noise ratios are going to be, and what kind of, of structure is going to be in your image to determine whether compressed sensing really has a, a competitive advantage or not. Okay, so I only have a couple of minutes left, and I just want to say a couple more, more words. Uh, first of all, uh, accounting for Poisson noise in these problems I think is pretty important. There are some pieces of conventional wisdom in the, com in the um, CS community, such as it doesn't really matter what our sparsifying basis is, or we're doing as well with compressed sensing as if we collected non-compressive measurements with some sort of clairvoyant knowledge of where the non-zeros were. Um, and both of those things sort of break down in this Poisson setting. So we get very different kinds of, of um, uh, behaviors. So our performance bounds or our mean squared error rates really do depend on the sparsifying basis, especially at low signal to noise ratios. And depending on the sparsity structure, it's possible to do much, much better than, not, than compressive measurements at these low signal to noise ratios. OK, so just, just a couple more words about actual computational methods. And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail uh, and instead just refer you to some papers on my web page. Um, but the question is, if we do have these measurements, how should we actually go about estimating F star? I've talked to you about rates, but not actually about what, what you should do to get these rates. So a lasso estimator would say, let's just minimize our sum of squared errors plus a sparsity term. And there's been a lot of research done on this optimization problem, great off-the-shelf software. 
but it completely ignores the effects of Poisson noise. And we've seen example after example today where that's a dangerous and, and bad thing to do. So then you could look and see what companies like GE do in their scanners. And they would say, I want to do something sort of like this lasso, but I want to account for the fact that these measurements in Y have non-uniform variances. I want to account for that non-uniformity, sort of analogous to what we tried to do with the Anscombe transform much earlier in the talk. And so they say, let's build some matrix sigma that's diagonal, and where the diagonal elements correspond to the standard deviations in Y, and we're going to put sigma inverse right here in our squared error measurement term. And this turns out to be a reasonably effective thing to do. Like I said, GE uses it. But really, it only works when you can get an accurate estimate of sigma, which is possible in tomography, but very difficult in most other settings. So it doesn't generalize well. And it turns out to have no known statistical error bounds. So it's hard to tell if it's optimal or not. So another method that you could consider, and this is why I've spent quite a bit of time developing algorithms and theory for is a regularized maximum likelihood approach, where you say, instead of measuring how well my estimate fits the data using a sum of squared errors, I'm going to use a Poisson log likelihood term. And this is a reasonable thing to do. Uh, like I said, I spent a lot of time developing software and theory for it. But it's, it's definitely got its challenges. Um, some of the analysis that I presented is very difficult to generalize beyond what I showed today because of the limitations of using this log likelihood. And for some technical reasons, it's kind of slower to compute than some of these lasso estimators we've been talking about. And when you're dealing with large data sets, speed can be pretty important. And so one of the things that we've been developing over the last year is a weighted lasso method, where what we're going to do is minimize a sum of squared errors that doesn't account at all for Poisson noise but use a sparsity regularizer that's weighted, where these weights do account for the Poisson noise. So this is very simple to compute with off-the-shelf software. Turns out to be much easier to analyze and generalize than some of our previous work. And we can use Poisson noise models and concentration inequalities to come up with good data-dependent weights that are going to, to lead to nice error bounds. And so, to wrap up, I'll just show you a very quick example where this weighted lasso per, uh, method, which I've shown the error of in red, does nearly as well as an oracle here in yellow and significantly better than a standard lasso kind of estimator that ignores the effects of Poisson noise. So what we've seen is that Poisson noise and photon limitations are really important to consider. They make a big difference in our understanding of how different imaging systems are going to work, and they make a big difference in terms of just practical performance. How, kind, how good of an estimate can we get out of very noisy data? And in general, we face this kind of very complex set of trade-offs between the signal to noise ratio, the sparsity, numbers of subspaces, or patch size, and computational efficiency of different algorithms. And so with that, I'd just like to invite you to become seduced by the dark side of imaging. I think there's a wealth of very exciting mathematical challenges there, and a number of applications, um, especially in science and engineering, where these methods are very highly relevant. Thank you very much.